Shukla ji, Duto Bajay, now you can start. Yes, thank you, sir. Namushkar. Welcome to everybody. Today's international webinar on COVID-19 pandemic, rethinking moral values and socio-economic perspectives has been organized jointly by the departments of economics and philosophy of Dirozio Memorial College in collaboration with internal quality assurance cell of our college. COVID-19 pandemic, the biggest crisis ever held in last 100 years has disrupted the whole economy of the world through innumerable deaths and sufferings of people followed by unprecedented overburden on health sectors, public and private, of each and every country going through this pandemic. The chain reactions of the remedial measures of sudden lockdown adopted by the policymakers are resultant on confinement in home, making social distancing, depression, domestic violence, moral hazards, job losses. As individual freedom is curtailed for the sake of public health, the issue of individuals' independent existence has also been questioned. Huge unemployment and contraction of gross domestic product has created economic crisis, which can be defined as life livelihood crisis. In last June quarter, GDP of not, not only India has quizzed by 23.9%, but more or less, same scenario is visible in each and every each and every country of the world. It has shaken the social sectors as well, for which why disparity in certain corners has occurred, especially in providing education, social security, and also in gender issues. We have also seen through media unbearable grief of laborers of or unorganized sector migrating from their place of work to their home. With this backdrop, now we are eager to listen from the specialized panelists of this international webinar in the next few hours. Before that, we request all participants including guests, to sing the national anthem of India standing in their own place. Janu Ganu Manu Bhanjaya Gaye <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
now we would like to request dr dibrendu talapatro principal of our college to deliver welcome okay. address thank you shukladi uh, a very good afternoon to all of you uh, i welcome all the participants who have joined the international webinar on covid 19 pandemic rethinking moral values and social economic perspectives we are extremely delighted to have with us the resource persons dr rahul shen senior lecturer auckland university of technology new zealand and dr riddhi chakraborty fhea program leader london uk thank you for joining in this program your presence today will not only uplift the moral of the teachers but also serve as an immense inspiration to all the students and teachers participating in this program we heartily welcome you i express my sincere gratitude to professor devabrata mukhopadhyay of department of economics west bengal state university for accepting the offer to deliver the keynote address i okay. welcome you sir from the bottom of my heart the covid-19 pandemic has sparked fears of an impending economic crisis and recession social distancing self isolation and travel restrictions have led to a reduced workforce across all economic sectors and caused many jobs to be lost colleges and universities have closed down to prevent spread of the virus within institutions and prevent carriage to vulnerable individuals these closures have had widespread socio economic implications covid-19 has affected communities community businesses and organizations globally inadvertently affecting the financial markets and the global economy the unusual lockdowns have led to a disruption in the supply chain resulting to a fall in stock market the travel industry is grappling with an unprecedented wave of cancellations and a significant drop in demand and strict governmental instructions to implement social distancing and the restrictions of unnecessary travel lockdown confinement at home and social distancing measures to prevent spread of virus have heightened fears of increasing levels of domestic violence which includes physical emotional and sexual abuse the honorable speakers will highlight on socio economic impact and other issues i express my sincere thanks to the organizing secretaries dr shukla chatterji and dr shangomito dasgupto for selecting such a relevant topic my sincere thanks to the iqac coordinator dr choitali mukherji seminar program committee conveners dr anjana chattopadhyay dr shoikat mondol the technical coordinator dr ovik roy for making the program live and to other teachers who worked relentlessly to make this webinar a successful one finally i welcome all the participants from all around the globe who have joined hands to make this program a fruitful one i now declare the webinar is open for further activity thank you thank you sir now Dr. Choitali Mukherjee, Coordinator of Internal Quality Assurance Sale, Dirozio Memorial College, is invited for the deliverance of the inaugural address. Dr. Choitali Mukherjee, please. Thank you. Thank you, Shukladi. Good afternoon, friends. It's my privilege to welcome our two distinguished speakers from two different continent. Dr. Rahul Sen from Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand, and Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty, FHEA, UK, and we have Dr. Devabrata Mukhopadhyay from West Bengal State University, representing the third continent of our globe. We all are waiting eagerly to listen your views on this dreaded situation our Earth is passing through. I welcome participants. from different institutions who have made our essay fruitful on behalf of 
IQAC of DeRosio Memorial College. I'm grateful to all my colleagues and students from Department of Economics and Philosophy for putting such sincere effort to organize the international webinar titled COVID-19 Pandemic, Rethinking Moral Values and Socioeconomic Perspectives. We have our principal, Dr. Dibendu Talapatru with us, who has encouraged and supported every venture we shaped so far. I welcome you too, sir. A warm welcome to respected teachers and dear students of our very own institution. The disaster that has enveloped us inside four walls and made many developmental moves stranded, especially in the fields of academics, economy, industry, agriculture, etc. But at the same time, it has successfully created some alternative openings to make the planet spin. And the most important of those is technology. This word presently has become our premier term to move on. Today, the listeners have been sitting in their own rooms and taking part in this discourse is enough to be a first-hand example of this boon. But at the same time, some moral values have developed during this uninterrupted family proximity shared amongst the members, especially growing kids. These future citizens of Earth are experiencing importance of nature at a very tender age. We all are trusting doctors and scientists more than the so-called spirit, be it bad or good. On the other hand, we could realize that the world economy by and large is at stake. But is there any positive lesson being learned from this condition that could make our future generation more cautious? Huge burden of unemployment will give birth to many antisocial activities. Sharp fall in school education system will generate more dropouts and malnutrition problem. Should we get equipped quickly? Should we get should we get quick equipped quickly enough to fight it out? We have many questions, but only patient waiting to get the answers. Let us listen from our learned friends what teachings we have from this enormous pause of COVID-19 and how to frame a secure future from this lesson. Once more, I share my sincere gratitude to both the eminent speakers for their positive response. My best wishes for coming Durga Puja to all present here. May her blessings provide us with courage to fight out the pandemic. Thank you once again. Thanks, Thank Dr. Mukherjee. Before entering into the technical sessions, we would like to request Professor Devabrata Mukhopadhyay, Professor in Economics, West Bengal State University, for the deliverance of keynote address. Professor Mukhopadhyay did his PhD from the Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta and joined West Bengal Education Service. He joined West Bengal State University in 2009. His diversified area of interest includes financial econometrics, applied time series analysis, econometric modeling of agricultural sectors of India and Asian countries as well. Foreign direct investments, capital market, and micro -econ sorry, macroeconomic fundamentals. He has published a large number of research papers in various journals with international and national level fame. Professor Mukhopadhyay, 
प्लीज सर अपनी बोलते शुरू करूं ओवर टू प्रोफेसर मुखोपाध्याय अनम्यूट अनम्यूट कर दिन सर अनम्यूट हेलो अच्छा participants uh, present here i am also uh, 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 i also observe that uh, some eminent speakers are there uh, who will deliver their lectures uh, now coming to the topic of this webinar uh, i will uh, just uh, focus on some specific social economic issues of covid 19 first of all uh, all we know that uh this is uh, a major uh, pandemic uh, in this present century but historically uh, there are uh, many uh, pandemics uh, the human civilization has faced throughout the uh, history uh, first of all as humans spread across the world infectious diseases have been constant companion in most of the cases it spread to trade routes the world has observed daily pandemics since antonine plague uh, 165 to 180 ad where 5 billion people died to covid 19 at the present uh, as we do, uh, as we observe that uh, more than uh, 990000 uh, people have already died as on 26 july as per the who reports now the highest death toll Uh, due to pandemic occurred during uh, 1347 to 1351 this was caused by, um, by black death uh, bubonic uh, plague this uh, uh, was in asia africa and other uh, and also in europe europe lost one third to half of its population and it took 200 years to recover and total death toll uh, was 200 million there are other major global pandemics in terms of its death tolls but smallpox of 1520 where 56 million people died spanish flu of 1918 uh, 19 uh, where 40 to 50 million people died and plague of justinian uh, 541 to 42 uh, ad where 30 to 50 million people died now there are some moral and socio economic uh, challenges of this pandemic the greatest moral challenge posed by a pandemic is how to respect commitments to social justice in the face of the overwhelming and entrenched inequalities governments bear a moral responsibility to identify where social injustices are likely to occur as the result of a pandemic and to take reasonable steps to prevent or reduce the worst among them some historical relations uh, on the uh, great influenza uh, john m barry wrote that if there is a if there is a single dominant relation from 1918 it's that governments need to tell the truth in a crisis those in authority must retain the public's trust 
the way to do that is to distort nothing but to put the best face on nothing to try to manipulate no one two on socio economic consequences pointed out on 3rd april 2020 the director general of the who stated that covid 19 is much more than a health crisis we are all aware of the profound social and economic consequences of the pandemic such consequences are the result of counter measures such as lockdowns and worldwide reductions in production and consumption amplified by cascading impacts to international supply chains some economic losses as of uh, may 2020 there are some estimates that global consumption losses amount to 3.8 uh, trillion us dollars triggering significant job losses 147 million full time equivalent job losses and income 2.1 us dollar trillion losses global atmospheres however uh, atmospheric emissions are uh, uh, drastically reduced which have already been pointed out some by some other uh, speakers given the important role of large coronavirus affected economies such as china europe and the us in global manufacturing and trade the slowdown in these countries production inevitably will lead to significant supply chain interactions affecting especially businesses that are heavily dependent on trade such as specialized manufacturing uh, there is a paper uh, by haren and simi levy in harvard business review and uh, this year and also uh, some people have uh, pointed out about healthcare supplies which have uh, will be affected due to uh, the disruptions in supply chains and uh, this has been pointed out by food and drug administration of the us now the economic consequences the businesses uh, may rely on inventories to bridge the temporary supply shortfalls generally for 2 to 5 weeks however after stocks are depleted ensuing their uh, declines in production will cascade throughout international supply chain networks affecting both downstream customers and upstream suppliers options for switching to alternative inputs are limited uh, wherever these inputs are specialized and essential such as parts for vehicles options for switching to alternative supply locations are also limited when production is concentrated or when the output of many regions is re uh, reduced and this has been the case during this covid period so some uh, statistics particularly pmi uh, this, which is called manufacturing purchasing managers index uh, we are uh, showing here the uh, pmi of the five largest economies in the world uh, during this covid 19 months we have considered here four months march april may june now we uh, observed that china has not been uh, affected significantly uh, the losses but in the us we found that uh, 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 the uh, uh, pmi value in april is much lower compared to march and also in may it is also uh, very low but uh, it is observed that uh, in june uh, some economies have started to recover as well from uh, this result we just observed that china has not been uh, very much affected although in april uh, it uh, fall uh, very slightly uh, but uh, after that it started to recover manufacturing at trade share of the five uh, largest economies uh, we all know that us is the largest economy in the world having 24.08% uh, gdp share followed by china 15.12% share and in terms of global manufacturing output we all know that uh, china is the highest share uh, of 28.4% uh, followed by usa 16.6% uh, Uh, if we uh, see uh, in india just india has 3.28% gdp share in the world and 3% global manufacturing output share some social consequences because while coronavirus has respected no national boundaries it will continue to discriminate against the most vulnerable sections of the society as observed by undp the whole human family will live with its effects for years to come So human development in covid-19 new uh, undp estimates as a combined measure of the world's education health and living standards hdi all we know uh, this is on course to decline this year for the first time since the concept was developed in 1990 the decline is expected to across the majority of countries rich and poor in every region some undp estimates on key variables of the economy now global per capita income is expected to fall 4% the world bank has warned that the virus could push between 
50 and 60 million into extreme poverty this year with sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia hardest hit. The International Labor Organization, ILO, estimates that half of working people could lose their jobs within the next few months and the virus could loss the cost of the global economy US $10 trillion. The ILO also says that in India alone, more than four, uh, 400 million people risk sliding into poverty because they are forced to rely on informal work. The World Food Program says that 265 million people will face crisis levels of hunger unless direct action is taken. This pandemic is a health crisis. Just I will conclude this uh, lecture by uh, a, a statement from uh, the UNDP administrator, uh, Asim uh, Strainer, who pointed out that this pandemic is a health crisis, but not just a health crisis. For first swaths of the globe, the pandemic will leave deep and deep scars. Without support from the international community, risks a massive reversal of gains made over the last two decades and an intergenerational loss, if not in lives, then in rights, opportunities, and dignity. Thank you all. We express heartily thanks to Professor Devabrata Mogopadhyay for his lucid, informative, and analytical speech on COVID-19 pandemics. Now we again request Professor Mukhopadhyay to preside over both the technical sessions. Now we enter into the technical session one. The speaker is Dr. Rahul Sen, senior lecturer, School of Economics, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand. Dr. Sen did his master's from Delhi School of Economics, Delhi University, and PhD from National University of Singapore. Before joining Auckland University of Technology in 2008, he pursued research with the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore from 2003 to 2007. His varied interest of research is with international economics, mainly trade policy and economic integration in the Asia Pacific region, especially trade policy, trade relations of various countries like Australia, China, ASEAN countries, and India with New Zealand. Dr. Sen is in various positions with different in international organizations. In the International Labor Organization, as a member of a research project and as the trade economist in the advisory committee board of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission, the Asia Pacific at Thailand. In addition, his expertise as an advisor in the econometric model building has been used by a global economic and management consulting firm titled Infinite Sum Modeling, through which impact of external shocks of global trade world is anticipated and introduction of digital technologies in international trade becomes possible. Dr. Rahul Sen has published a number of research papers in various international journals and also acts as an associate editor of a SAID journal, Foreign Trade Review. Today, Dr. Rahul Sen will speak on economic effects of COVID-19 in short and long run, a global perspective with relations for India. 
Now, Dr. Rahul Sen, please, over to him. Thank you, uh, Shukladi. Thank you. Hopefully, everyone can hear me, and I'm just sharing my presentation now. Uh, just hopefully it works. Yes, there we are. I hope everyone can see my slides. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this uh, webinar. And uh, good afternoon and sort of a late night for me here. It's kind of 10 o'clock here in uh, New Zealand. So uh, I'm going to be talking about mainly the economic effects and essentially start off with a little bit of the data on how India compares vis-a-vis -vis other countries when we are looking at the response for COVID-19. And then, of course, look at the short and long-run economic effects with uh, some lessons, I think, that uh, India can learn from <clears throat> this pandemic. So uh, let's sort of start off with uh, where we are right now. So as we know, uh, this uh, pandemic sort of started in the beginning of 2020. Officially, it was declared a pandemic on the 11th of March. And uh, six months almost, more than six months into that, uh, as of 23rd of September, we had uh, infection spreading to 215 countries. And we have about 33 million people right now affected, half of them just only within the three countries of United States, India, and Brazil. But what is concerning is that the rate of global infections have been very rapidly rising uh, in the last few months. So even six months later, we don't see any, any end <clears throat> to this pandemic. Uh, if anything, it still continues to grow and grow with you know new kind of mutations as the World Health Organization seems to be alerting us. So clearly there's a very high acceleration at which this pandemic is growing. And clearly that problem is overwhelming healthcare systems in countries around the world. And precisely because of that reason, there is huge economic disruptions as we just heard in the keynote. And this really is never is something kind of a one in a century event because this was not really experienced before even in our past generations. And uh, it has already begun to have very serious social economic and it could possibly even have political repercussions, which are really yet to you know, unfold completely because it's only six months into this. But let's just have a, a kind of a look at the data and look at some comparisons uh, in terms of you know, some statistics that I kind of compiled from this very uh, good data source where almost every day you get data updated on COVID globally. And we can see that while India sort of ranks in second right now in the number of worldwide cases, and that number as of today, I think is close to uh, about 6 million. So, uh, and uh, in terms of recovery, however, India actually has a, a one of the best recovery rates. So although cases are growing, but in India, actually, the rate of recovery is quite good, much better compared to the US, certainly, as we can see here. Uh, in terms of cases per million also, if you look at the spread, because often it's good to look at a per capita perspective. So if you look at a case per million population sort of spread, then also we see that India's, uh, you know, in, in terms of the official numbers that we have, obviously there's debate that these are not the complete numbers. You know, there could be number of untested people out there which are not recorded in the official numbers. But based on these official numbers, it suggests that the spread is not, you know, very huge. And as we know, if you, if you know, uh, as you know the data of, uh, you know, uh, region-wise spread in India, the biggest spread of the pandemic has been concentrated mainly around the four metro cities and the states around that. But obviously, it's, it is pretty be, uh, beyond that. So obviously, beyond uh, Delhi, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, uh, Bengal, um, Karnataka, those being, being sort of the, you know, main states, of course, where the pandemic sort of started off from. But what is really important to understand here is while India has a good recovery rate, 
It has sort of lower cases per million in per capita terms. But it also, if you look at the ranking in terms of the tests per million of population, this is where I think a lot more work needs to be done, especially if India needs to have any good control over the pandemic. Because in terms of the ranking, it's pretty uh, concerning to note that India's ranking in terms of test per million population is actually much behind uh, Brazil, uh, which is the third highest in the number of cases. And uh, also it's, it's lowest among all these countries. And if you look at the bottom of the table, I just put Australia and New Zealand to just put a perspective in terms of how these countries have been able to better manage the pandemic in terms of having a very high rate of recovery. But more importantly, ramping up the testing in a very, very short period of time. And I think this, this is where, you know, this is going to be really key in terms of getting a good control over, over this pandemic over, over the next few months. So testing is, is really, really important. Coming to the economics of it, obviously, uh, for most countries, uh, in fact, for uh, perhaps except for China, every other country, it was a purely external shock. That was unanticipated. Uh, I mean, uh, people knew that, yes, this was uh, another uh, virus which could, which could potentially be deadly, but the extent to which it could spread, uh, how rapidly it would spread, no one was really aware of it. And even frankly speaking, even here in New Zealand, I mean, uh, we were still sort of, uh, I, I remember in February, when we were about to start our university, we were still having, you know, students uh, coming in uh, from China, people could travel. Uh, tourists coming in from China, by the way, is the largest trading partner here of New Zealand. And uh, it, it took them some time also to realize that, no, they need to actually, you know, do something much more serious. Uh, and uh, as uh, mentioned uh, right in the opening remarks, uh, it did come to the extent of curtailing personal freedom to get some control of this pandemic. So, yes, the initial response has been mixed. So we have had some countries like New Zealand, uh, including India as well, as well as China, Australia, going for a much more stronger response initially, trying to go for a lockdown, full or partial lockdown of their economic activities. And that time, the key reason was that, you know, the scientists were really advising that given the rapid spread of this virus, you need to flatten the curve. You just need to make sure that the case numbers go down as soon as possible so that your healthcare systems are not overwhelmed. Uh, but obviously, you know, all the countries didn't necessarily go with that kind of an advice. So we had other countries which opted to go for a uh, much lesser sort of a, a restriction on economic activities rather than go for more widespread contract tracing and social distancing measures. And of course, for them, the key was to keep the economy moving. So. US, UK, Sweden, and Taiwan. Taiwan uh, being one of the best cases in terms of, uh, you know, the lessons that we get in terms of how to handle this pandemic. Yeah, because Taiwan has had one of the lowest case numbers while still keeping the economy moving, while still keeping it at the lowest level of restrictions. And when we want to understand the level of restrictions, we have some fantastic data coming out from Oxford University's project uh, which gives us a policy stringency index. And I'll just show you the policy stringency index, which, you know, which will give you an idea in terms of how countries have tackled you know, COVID over time since it sort of initiated. Uh, but, and what we will note, and as I just mentioned to you, in each of these responses, there's a trade-off between lives and livelihood. And obviously in the beginning, given that people thought the virus was a lot more deadly in terms of, uh, you know, the way it was affecting people thought it was important. Uh, a lot of governments thought it was important to sort of, you know, get restrictions at the first place so that the spread is stopped. You can flatten the curve as soon as possible. And yes, that will sacrifice economic freedom and economic activities for a short period of time. But as they say, you know, short term pain for long term gain. And that was really the reason why if you look at this graph, you will note that since the pandemic, uh, the WHO sort of declared it as a global pandemic uh, on March 11th, number of countries scaled up their policy response in terms of restrictions on economic activity. So an index here, which is developed by the Oxford University from zero to 100, 100 is really the most stringent, the strictest. 
And this is where India's case was unique because India was perhaps one of the very few developing countries and definitely the only emerging economy among the larger economies to go for the strictest possible lockdown. So the index of 100, as we can see, has been mapped over a few weeks of March to April. And it's not that it was alone. I mean, you had New Zealand also in a similar situation, a much smaller country, population of 5 million only. But uh, also we went for a near full lockdown. I mean, we also had just only essential services uh, uh, being open. We could just go to the supermarket. Only one person from one family could go to the supermarket. And then, of course, you know, the usual restrictions were there. Uh, but uh, the mirrored response here sort of, you know, finishes after the end of April. Because it, what happened is New Zealand somehow how got better control of this pandemic, was able to manage the spread of the first wave. And hence, we see this red line for New Zealand coming down drastically from the high 90s in terms of the policy stringency all the way down to 40s and the 20s. And then we had a 100-day COVID-free uh, you know, uh, run. And actually, most of us thought that we uh, in New Zealand actually had sort of got ridden of COVID because borders were closed and we didn't have any cases coming in for 100 days. But then here we go, from the 11th of August, we had a second wave hit us again, mainly in Auckland. And therefore, uh, Auckland, even as of today, is sort of in a partial alert level or partial sort of a lockdown state. Uh, so hence, you see again that you know line sort of going up for New Zealand. But that's the New Zealand response. And compare it with the US, where you can see sort of a flat sort of a line Almost, and the same thing for the United Kingdom, if you were to look at the data. So this shows the difference in the uh, government response uh, stringency. And as I said, uh, US and Taiwan, therefore, are really the contrast. Because for US, as you know, there was almost no lockdown. I mean, of course, state-wise, there were uh, some lockdowns for a certain period of time. But the extent to which rules were followed is another issue. And I'll come to that, that part again. But Taiwan, as I said, is one of the best countries, uh, uh, as I mean, one of the countries that have sort of best managed uh, this pandemic. And uh, this is really the list in terms of who have been doing best in terms of uh, control over the pandemic. And if you have a look at this list, we see, first of all, most of these are developed countries which have more resources. China being the only developing country top in the list among the top 10 in terms of the top 30 ranking of countries who are doing better. And most of these are smaller economies, much, much more smaller when we compare it to a country like uh, you know, India or the United States or, or Brazil for that matter. So clearly one thing that does come out from this pandemic is large countries have a much, much bigger challenge on their hands compared to you know, smaller sized economies here. Smaller sized ec economies possibly have a chance in getting a grip over this pandemic in a relatively shorter period of time, maybe in a year, of course, depends again on whether we have, you know, a second wave coming or not. But for large countries, the story could be a lot more uh, difficult. And what really makes the economic impact so severe is, you know, uh, if you look at the level of inter economic interconnectedness we have through air transport, through value chain based trade, this was a lot, lot greater than uh, you know, SARS in 2003, which was sort of the last sort of similar, uh, you know, uh, virus uh, that that was that mainly spread around Asia. Although. But the other problem that makes it really severe this time is the very high rate of people to people transmission. And the biggest problem also apparently in this virus is that you can be asymptomatic, asymptomatic, which means you don't even know that you have the virus and you actually are infected and you pass it on. And the other problem being, there's no vaccine available, you require work from home, social distancing, and of course, that requirement for very quick contact tracing and aggressive targeted testing. And the last two, as I said, are the real key to get any sort of control on this pandemic. So naturally, this was something new for governments around the world, because uh, you know, they hadn't dealt with a virus, first of all, where people could be not even knowing that they have the virus and they are transmitting. And worse still, 
there is surface to surface transmission so you don't even know you are in a lift and 10 minutes later you know you catch the virus because someone who was infected and not even coughing or showing any symptoms just use the lift and this actually happened in new zealand we had one emergency worker affected by covid uh, in a managed isolation hotel and he was doing all the right things i mean he was washing his hands he was wearing mask everything but even after that he got it so given the nature of this virus therefore the government really have been caught unawares and as i said we have some of them have relied on scientific evidence to formulate policy response which i think work better but the real problem that we also have this time is there's a lack of global coordination effort every country is trying to do everything on their own and sadly when you have a global problem it needs global solutions but uh, you know we haven't really able to find any global solution to this coming to the channels through which you know your economy is affected well as economic students uh, who who are there you know attending today your standard macroeconomics would tell you that all the engines of growth uh, basically were affected here except for the government channel which is the government expenditure so you had consumption badly hit you had investment badly hit you had exports and imports hit as well so in the short term obviously it was an inevitable conclusion given the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, the impact that uh, covid had in the first few months that countries were going to be uh, definitely pushed into recession which is basically two consecutive uh, quarters of negative growth um the response well if you had to think in terms of response we also have to think in terms of the shocks so the shocks as we can see from the infographic from the adb uh, which had a very interesting study uh, uh, in april on the updated assessment of uh, the economic impact of covid-19 you have the trade channel the trade costs obviously your trade costs go up because of disruptions not just because of tourism obviously tourism is the biggest sector that is affected and then you have the negative productivity shock which is coming from your production disruptions due to lockdowns uh, you know restrictions on labor mobility restrictions on transport and all that uh, is also translating into lower consumption growth people are not obviously coming out of their homes work from home so most of the online business is going on and the worst hit is obviously investment so the policy response very naturally for most economies have been to somehow support them by expansionary fiscal and monetary policies in the short term but as we all know as students of economics there is always a limit to expansionary fiscal and monetary policies and this is really the challenge in the short run that to what extent countries will have to continue that support and how much capacity each country has to provide that support uh, for example you know uh, countries like india would obviously have a much lesser uh, fiscal support available than you know smaller countries probably sort of the covid winner countries that that i uh, you know showed you uh, in the previous slides uh, the sectoral impacts who are gaining who are losing well we know that the sectoral impacts have been less severe in industries where there is work from home where there is an a quick adoption to online technology those sectors somehow have been surviving won't say they have been doing very well the sectors which have possibly uh, done better is obviously the healthcare sector healthcare products and services with you know greater demand for masks and uh, sanitizers and also for health equipments and the hardest hit globally has obviously been tourism air transport and the related sectors of hospitality retail food and accommodation so uh, clearly it's the services which have actually sort of been the primary chain here in terms of the economic external economic shock and uh, even for india also if you look at the way the cases came in it all came in through tourism and air transport so looking at the short term obviously the picture is pretty bad and the oecd's interim economic outlook forecast that has been released as of september shows that almost every country and this is not just india every country is going to face a negative growth in this quarter as almost already anyway faced and uh, the extent to which it's going to go down 
uh, it will also therefore depend on how quickly it can recover. So the expectation is that there will be sort of a V-shaped recovery. There will be a very deep decline this year in economic growth across major countries, with the possible exception of China. China, as you can see, is expected to still grow by 1.8% this year and rebound back by 8%. But uh, most of the other countries, much slower than that. But nevertheless, there is an assumption that there's a V-shaped recovery in 2021. Uh, but the assumption here is one, there is no second wave or even possible third or multiple, which, you know, something completely uncertain. We don't know whether we're going to face it. Infections, particularly in the bigger countries uh, like India, for example, we may be looking at a W-shaped recovery, which means you basically are going to have a very sharp decline, then sort of recover to some extent, but then again be pulled down by another multiple wave, and then again attempt to recover, which is more of a W shape. And this really is something which is up to you know uh, speculation at this moment. So. While the initial you know, uh, thought was that most of these countries will get out with a V-shaped recovery, uh, it could well be for some countries even a W-shaped one. And that's, that's obviously going to be more painful if it's a W-shaped economic recovery. The bigger issue is when we look at the short-term economic impact, uh, the expectation is that even if there is a recovery by 2021, it's nowhere going to be close to the pre-COVID levels of 2019. So it's obviously going to be recovery in the sense of economic growth picking up, but it will still be pulled behind to quite an extent. And we are talking about the global economy and that obviously includes larger countries like India. And the other issue is what is noted by the OECD report here is that what is inevitable is across all countries, you will see widespread economic hardship, job losses, which we are already seeing. And it's going to be really worse for those countries where you have more of hourly wage or informal labor workers like India, particularly where you have direct fiscal support, which is also lesser. Uh, because if you have a larger part of the economy involving these kind of workers, uh, these short term impact will have long run repercussions and long run repercussions, not just in terms of economic, but even in terms of social repercussions, uh, uh, as we would expect. But OECD makes a very, very important statement. And I think this is a clear message that goes to policymakers all around the world, that restoring confidence is really crucial at this moment in terms of telling the public that, look, this is something which we have to learn to safely live with, safely live with for some time. It's not something which is going to go over very soon. And I think this reality is something which, which you know, policymakers need to be very clear about. And to some extent in New Zealand, this was one of the major reasons why the country got better control over the pandemic. And even the prime minister here has agreed to it that our, as, he, as she says, the team of five million. So it's basically everyone within the country actually, you know, uh, listened to what was needed. And they actually acted according to what they thought would be good for them. And they did actually listen to the policymakers. They had confidence in the policymakers. So restoring confidence in the public here is very, very important in the short run, because otherwise they will have even worse long run repercussions. And the story for India, as most of you already know, and this chart on the left obviously comes from the quarter on quarter growth, which was worse than the 20 minus 23.9% year on year that's being reported for India. But numbers apart, what is really uh, the fact is that India has been one of the worst hit G20 countries because of the uh, and, uh, post this pandemic. And while it has been one of the primary reasons is that policy stringency. As you can see, and as I had mentioned to you earlier before, India was perhaps only the 
only emerging economy and definitely the only one in this list that you can see among the IMF chart there, which had the strictest government stringency during that April to May period, which is essentially almost the period of that second quarter that the data was collected. So it's no surprise that that stringent lockdown would lead to this outcome. But the bigger issue is that how quickly can India sort of recover from this situation? Because as we can see, the level of restrictions have reduced, but still India's uh, you know, level of restrictions is, is fairly in the 80s, which, which is justified given the kind of pandemic situation uh, that exists there. But the other issue for India, and this is pretty unique to India, by the way, among all the economies affected by COVID, is unfortunately, there is a timing issue here. It's a bad timing problem in the sense that, you know, when the idea was to reform the economy, to structurally change the economy through demonetization or GST in 2016 and 17, there was no Donald Trump, there was no trade war, and obviously there was no inkling of something like COVID coming in. So I think the intentions at that point of time were pretty good. Obviously, the issues around implementation have been debated, and it's a fact that, yes, the structural changes which were required with those two policies led to slowdown in consumption, demand, and investment in 2017. Informal sector obviously has been hit very badly with that demonetization GST, but the idea was to ultimately reform the economy and get it on the growth path. And that's because, you know, generally globalization was doing well. Uh, you know, there were there wasn't tendencies towards protectionism. But the, as I said, it's a timing problem. Unfortunately, within a year of, you know, having GST and within almost two years of in US, and then, of course, indirectly involving U.S. China as well. Now, obviously, if you look at the economic impact of this, India was a third party. So it wasn't really very badly affected. Yes, U.S. trade. U.S. India trade was affected and U.S. being the largest trading partner, certain export sectors were definitely affected. But overall, I mean, even the modeling exercise that we have done in our study suggests that trade war didn't actually hit the economy adversely. There was a slowdown in the external sector growth. But the problem was there was no gain either. There was no gain in exports. There was no gain in investments, some of which were actually redirected from China due to the global trade war. Vietnam, for example, was one of the biggest gain, uh, had, had one of the biggest gains because of the trade war. But those gains were, weren't really reaped by India. And there are a number of reasons because of that, you know, uh, issues of infrastructure and other reforms, which weren't really carried out by that time. And then we have the third hit, so that's the global pandemic. And this again hit the informal sector. So for, from India's perspective, the problem is that the economy was already slowing down, trying to adjust to some very strong structural changes through those policies announced. And then we had this huge external shocks, the first one obviously a milder one, through the trade war and then this big global pandemic. So India's situation in that sense in the short run is a much more serious one in terms of the drop it had because it was already slowing down. So it was already pulled down even further. Now, what about the recovery? When we are talking about the recovery, we have to think about three sort of pillars here. And again, I'm quoting the OECD's interim September economic outlook report, which focuses very clearly on the fact that for a recovery from this pandemic, any country, including India, will have to look at these three pillars. The first pillar is obviously the health pillar. You have to get control over the pandemic. There has to be global coordination towards getting a vaccine that works for most of the population. Then the digital and green technologies focus. That is very important. So the focus on sustainable development is important. And as we have all learned through this pandemic, digital technologies are really very, very important and therefore, every country needs to spend much more heavily on digital technologies. And last but not the least, social security and training for skill development, investment in people. So these are really the three pronged sort of strategy if you, if you want to think about it in the long run. 
So let me just come to the long run economic impact then that we are talking about. So what happens in the long run? As we already know in the short run, you know, there is already a possibility of a W-shaped recovery and we even don't know how, you know, quality, uh, how much quality will be there in that economic recovery. But there's already some long run responses that we can see coming from this pandemic. And the, really the top three are the key. The fourth one is kind of related to the fiscal support that the government really needs to give. So let's sort of examine some of these uh, you know, issues with respect to the long run for a few minutes while, and then wrapping up with the lessons from India. So the first response, particularly from India's perspective, that is interesting to note is a rethink around globalization due to, due to this pandemic. So as you all know, um, uh, in India, there's, there's this new policy of Atman Nirbhar Bharat policy package, which of course, uh, you know, focuses on self-reliance. And uh, the very recently released report by the Economist Intelligence Unit, EIU report, they focused on India, China, and Indonesia as three emerging markets, which are already rethinking globalization. So it's not just India. China also, because of the trade war, is focusing on self-sufficiency, especially because of the worsening trajectory of uh, relations with the US. Uh, India's reasons are, of course, driven by geopolitical intentions and security concerns uh, uh, related with uh, the economic dependence, uh, concerns about economic dependence on China. So there is a move towards this self-reliance. And that, to some extent, obviously signals a move towards import substitution. Now, as a trade economist myself, the simple message that comes through is anything like this is welfare reducing. It generates inefficiencies because trade is the best way that you can allocate your resources more efficiently. You are generating inefficiencies, particularly if domestic industries are protected from competition. Uh, so you don't want something like an infant industry argument to you know, uh, research. And the most important point that is that is worth thinking here in self-reliance strategy is that while you want to reduce imports, you do not want to put barriers on imported intermediate inputs that are used by exporters because then they could potentially reduce your exports as well. And that's actually your engine of growth. So it could turn out to be counterproductive. And this is where the concern, I think, is in terms of going in this long-term direction. Let's look at what EIU has to say. So this is EIU's projections. If countries, these three countries, China, India, and Indonesia turn inwards you know, by 2030. And I'm just going to be focusing only on India. As you can see, their focus is if India continues on this path and is successful with this package, then in terms of the nominal GDP by 2030, they expect that to go up to 5.2 trillion from 2.9 trillion right now. <clears throat> and the share of world GDP to increase from 3.3 to 3.9%, which is a growth nevertheless. But what if there wasn't self-reliance? What if there was a little bit more focus on export competitiveness? The story could have been a little bit more different here, I think. So from India's perspective, obviously, the Atmanirva Bharat uh, program, as you know, focuses on key sectors where India needs to be self-reliant in domestic production, such as electronic parts, components, pharmaceuticals, defense, aerospace, and all that. So there's a two-pronged strategy. <clears throat> you want to enhance your domestic manufacturing capability, so you reduce your reliance on imports. And at the same time, you want to boost your share of world exports. But there is a problem here between the top two strategies. The problem is that if you want to increase protectionism, while you want to also achieve export growth to the rest of the world, you cannot assume that if you put protectionist barriers on your trading partners, they are not going to raise trade, trade barriers against you. Because trade is not a zero sum game. You know, it is you have both countries typically would want to reduce their trade barriers in order to gain the fruits from international trade. So if you have this kind of a strategy where you want to increase protectionism, but at the same time want to achieve export growth, I think it's, it's, it's a bit tricky here because it also 
takes into account that you are not going to get retaliation from your trading partners. And which also therefore means that in foreign policy terms, India will also probably have to look for strengthening economic relations with some strategic economic partners. Uh, obviously, very briefly on digital and green technologies in the long run, these are all going to be vital for your total factor productivity improvement and adapting to the externalities coming from climate change. And I think this is the biggest opportunity for countries like India. Investing heavily in digital and green technologies is where I think India's growth strategy is going to be transformed. And we already know that you know uh, there are uh, very good uh, uh, packages and uh, economic uh, reform uh, <clears throat> sort of strategies being already on the table, such as Digital India, Skill India, et cetera, for uh, uh, the economy to adapt to more digital technologies. And of course, there's emphasis on the blue economy to you know, focus on sustainable development and also adapt green technologies. And in the end, this will drive innovation, improve efficiency. economics, uh, social uh, side of this pandemic and the impact on it. And from the economic perspective, it's really the rising income inequality. And that's a huge concern, particularly in countries like India, because job losses keep on mounting, livelihoods are affected, and uh, you need targeted government support for these people so that you know they can somehow uh, keep on earning their livelihoods and you know, uh, at least survive from this pandemic. Uh, but it's a really big challenge for India, particularly given the large informal labor sector that it has. And we all know one of the key reasons why you know the argument that is often given that uh, India went for this strictest lockdown, but it kind of backfired because the moment India sort of uh, reduced that policy stringency and allow the migrants to go back home. And then we now see that the cases sort of you know, ballooned. And that was simply because this informal labor sector was, you know, has its has its own sort of issues with respect to its its position in the labor market. And this is something which wasn't really considered. And I think uh, if you if you think in hindsight, maybe a good idea would have been. To just give a few more days before you know before going to that strictest lockdown, so that you allowed some of these people to actually go back to their respective states, because the conditions in which they were living in those cities, which is well known, again you know there is no possibility of having social distancing. Uh, so, given that kind of a situation from India's perspective economic inequality, income inequality is going to be hitting hard for the informal labor sector. And this is where governments would, would need to probably give a lot more attention to and possibly also look into the opportunities where informal sector can actually work with the formal sector to generate some trade opportunities. Small and medium enterprises is what I'm talking about. Because there's a lot of export opportunities in India from you know traditional sectors, from SMEs. And this this has not yet been reaped here. And again, comes back to my point that, you know, while it's a good idea to think about being self-reliant, but the export opportunities should not be sacrificed. So coming to the lessons for India, I would say it's pretty clear from the Indian perspective. And initially, obviously, when the lockdown was so strict, was lives matter, you know, livelihoods can come later. But now, obviously, it's not just in India, but even in New Zealand, it's pretty clear that lives matter, so do livelihood, and lockdowns really aren't effective, full lockdowns. And they aren't effective, especially if public doesn't comply. And this is going to be a lot more harder in India than other countries, because India has a lot more bigger mix of people, 
having a lot more different, you know, uh, behavioral, uh, the way they behave in society. So everyone is not going to be, you know, adhering to that social distancing norms and thinking that this is something which is, you know, worth doing. As, as, as we already know, it impinges upon personal freedom. So it's not something easy. And we have seen that here in New Zealand also. There are fringe groups here who have been protesting. They think that, you know, it is uh, definitely something which is unima unimaginable in a democratic country, you know, uh, asking people to wear masks. Uh, some even compare wearing masks on faces to, you know, that uh, comparing them to restricting the freedom and all that. But we also have to look at the scientific evidence. And the scientific evidence is very clear. Uh, and that's why even in New Zealand, six months later into the pandemic, mask wearing is now mandatory in public transport. More people are wearing masks in public places because they understand that it probably saves them from this pandemic. And it's important not to fool ourselves that, you know, the pandemic is just like a common flu. We have been hearing this in a lot of places. But the fact is, it's not. There are a lot of scientific evidence that there are serious medical after effects to this virus. So it's not a good idea to get this to a herd immunity and let, you know, let this get to people. I mean, Sweden is one such country which thought of doing that. But again, there are questions on whether that was a very good thing to do. And the second lesson that we get is testing tracing and isolating, these three things, and at a very rapid pace, possibly doing that within 24 hours, is a key to containment. And that's the way New Zealand is doing it right now. We have a tracing app, and that tracing app uh, works. I mean, people are required uh, to use it wherever they go. I'm using it thoroughly wherever I'm going, you know, even to pick up a coffee. I'm going and, you know, uh, signing onto that app. So it's, it's important here because it just makes you safer also because by chance, if you have any potential case around there, you'll be quickly traced and you know whether you are you know a casual contact or uh, you are a close contact. And obviously they're only targeting mainly close contacts first for testing. So there's a need for clear public messaging here with sufficient time for compliance. And this is not easy especially in a large country like India, we all have to acknowledge it's just not easy. Because even in a small country like New Zealand, it hasn't been easy. Even in a country of 5 million, adjusting over frequently changing alert levels, you know, from the strictest possible alert level 4 to 3 to right now, we, are, we, had, we had been in 2.5 for a couple of weeks. And there was a lot of confusion. What is 2.5? So it's, it's not something which is, which is really easy. And for India, it's, it's going to be even more challenging. Uh, let me also end by saying that from the economic perspective, the lesson that we see for India is making India is important, but we also have to make for the world. And it's important not to underestimate that potential of trade, to unlock your growth opportunities, to resist protectionism, and to create opportunities for SMEs to export globally. So even if you attract foreign investment, the idea should not be just to produce within India and sell in India, but also attract efficiency seeking investment, create global export platforms through those investments. Of course, unlock the potential of digital and green technologies, focus on sustainable development, and focus on your inclusive growth strategy in the long run, because you have to target the most vulnerable sections who have lost livelihood. So in conclusion, we all know COVID-19 has thrown unexpected challenges for policymakers but in the long run, some have responded better than others, and the public response has played a vital role in terms of how countries are coming up. Indian economy has obviously been a lot more vulnerable than others, mainly because of a pre-COVID slowdown, which was a unique situation for India. So COVID-19 has made it even more worse because now you have multiple demand, supply, and trade-related shocks. So the road to recovery is a long and an uncertain one, unfortunately. So at this stage, no one knows when we can recover and how we will recover if we ever will. And this just does not only apply to India. I would say this even applies to the global economy because uh, uh, right now, the other uncertainty we are facing is the US elections. So if we do have the same outcome in the US elections that we had in 2017, this, this could, you know, no one knows in what direction this whole pandemic might be going through. 
And then we have India's move to be self-reliant, which while exporting to the world in an area of growing protectionism, I think is, is, uh, is, a, is a great idea, but it doesn't come without its own challenges. There's need to be, there needs to be accompanied reforms to, to make sure that you know, we don't go back into that infant industry kind of a uh, situation that we were earlier. And last but not the least, focusing on digital and green technologies, unlocking their potential, and therefore using that for inclusive growth is important in a long run, final, long run recovery. And therefore, we need to have a good amount of fiscal support here. And this is where India's position again is probably a little bit more, you know, uh, less luckier compared to others because uh, India doesn't have enough room to play around with that fiscal support. And let me also add that with the financial and banking sector problems that has uh, been there in India more recently, even from the monetary policy perspective, things do look a bit more challenging. So I think on that ground, I will stop here. Thank you very much for listening to this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Sain, for your analytical and uh, eye-opening speech on economic perspectives of COVID-19 pandemic uh, throughout the world, along with India. Now, uh, Professor Devabrata Mukhopadhyay is requested to give a short overview on the deliverance of Dr. Rahul said, followed by question answer, question answer session of the technical session one on economics. Professor Mukhopadhyay, please. Not audible. Uh, yeah. Is, uh, he has covered uh, many issues uh, which are very important. Uh, first of all, uh, he has uh, pointed out that India's uh, recovery rate is uh, is very good compared to other countries. Uh, next, uh, India has also lower uh, per capita infection rate is also low compared to other countries. He has also pointed out. Uh, on a large and uh, massive uh, strict lockdown uh, India has exhibited uh, during the uh, last few months. And also, actually, he has uh, pointed out on uh, short-run and long-run effects. Uh, considering the short-run effect, uh, he, ob he has observed that uh, most of the countries, major economies, uh, are expected to have negative uh, growth uh, in the last or in uh, the coming uh, few um, uh, quarters. And uh, also, uh, as far as India is concerned, that India is expected to face a W-shaped uh, recovery uh, curve. And also, uh, he has uh, pointed out on a certain other uh, social and uh, economic impact. Uh, actually, uh, what he has pointed out is very important to note that Restoring confidence uh, in public, uh, that is uh, the most important thing that people are facing uncertainty, investors are face facing uncertainty, consumers are facing uncertainty. So this is, this is a gloomy situation and restoring this uh, confidence among the uh, economic agents is utmost important uh, for, uh, such, for a, a huge economy like India. India is also a uh, worst hit uh, G20, as he has pointed out. As far as the long-run effects are concerned, uh, he has rightly pointed out that rethinking globalization as India uh, is uh, going to uh, focus on, uh, like self-reliance, uh, import substitution, export promotion policies. But he has some reservations on those policies. Actually, he, uh, he uh, emphasized that such kind of policies, uh, uh, depending on the infant industry argument, may be uh, may be counterproductive in the sense that may not yield uh, desired results. So India should be cautious uh, in that front. Next, he has pointed out on uh, development of digital and green technologies, which are very important and huge investments in this regard are necessary uh, to recover uh, and also to 
have an alternative path of development for countries like India. And he has also pointed out uh, in the long run uh, that uh, India may exhibit, uh, like many other countries, rising inequalities, which has also been pointed out by UNDP and other uh, international organizations. And uh, in front of that, uh, in order to address uh, such uh, possible rising inequality, he pointed out that two shifts uh, growth path uh, should be initiated. And in uh, above all, uh, he pointed out that uh, uh, physical support. Uh, as uh, uh, given by many other countries like US, Japan and other countries uh, should have been uh, much more uh, bigger in India on, uh, uh, in relation to other countries. So uh, with all these uh, lessons uh, he has uh, given, I think that it should, it should be highly beneficial for our participants. Now back to the coordinator. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukhopadhyay. Now, uh, question answer session uh, for Dr. <laughs> Dr. Rahul Sen. And I invite uh, Rimpa Chandu, faculty of our college. Uh, she will put questions before Dr. Rahul Sen. I think there are several questions. And uh, in 10 minutes time, time is 10 minutes. Thank you. I'd like to request. Uh, request. Am I audible now? Yes, you are audible. I'd like to oh, present oh. the questions on behalf of the participants. We have a question yeah. from. We have a question from Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee that international cooperation is re required to tackle the pandemic in lines with the symbolic response of the WHO in declaration of the pandemic, does our international agencies credible? Over to you, sir. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a valid point because obviously, uh, you know, with uh, the WHO's response that we are, we are seeing, there has been obviously questions on uh, you know, whether uh, there is enough credibility in that organization to lead uh, the coordination efforts. But then again, uh, there is also an issue here in terms of, uh, you know, the way generally global coordination has broken down, not just in, in the area of, you know, uh, health uh, organization, but you look at the WTO, you look at uh, any other organizations, particularly since 2017, since Trump took office, we have seen that there has been a tendency of the U.S. anyway to you know, get away from some of these global coordination efforts. And US has generally been a leader in this issue. When you see the leader walking away, then others also lose the credibility in that organization to you know, uh, think about uh, having any kind of uh, interest in taking these global coordination efforts seriously. So I think the buck here should have started with the United States and being the country that has most suffered the most in this pandemic, uh, I think they, they should have they should have seriously taken the WHO uh, to task for this. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We also have another question from Ashutosh Srivastava. The recent trains, according to an article by Indian Express, show the number of retail investors in stock market have nearly doubled during the lockdown. Can this increase the investing behavior of the masses be seen as a positive sign for long-term recovery of India? Over to you, sir. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, if uh, stock market indices are often obviously taken as a health of the economy, particularly looking near the future, and as we all know, stock market investments are based on expectations. And I think at this moment, given the kind of support packages, the policy responses that the Indian government has provided for this pandemic, given the you know unprecedented situation that they were faced, because let's you know give credit to the fact that at least in the initial stages, when the pandemic was you know uh, officially known in March, uh, you know the government took a very very bold step of having this kind of a lockdown 
a regional lockdown to prevent the spread and to try and you know uh, have a flattening of the curve and it was i think based on the responses of other countries so i won't say that the response had a problem the problem was with the implementation and that is obviously always an issue in in a, in a country like india but that being said i think the policy packages that have been announced so far to help uh, you know certain sectors of the economy are giving a positive signal and as i have already mentioned in my presentation i mean although people are making a lot about that minus 23.9 but a lot of that contribution is simply because of that april to may stringent policy lockdown that was there and now that's no more so we would expect the economic recovery to come back and i think that's that's the signal that's that's coming out from there and partly also maybe because of the atmanirbhar bharat uh, policy package because there are some very key important sectors where india wants to develop self reliance wants to aim to increase the size of manufacturing uh, which has been a very key and important sector that has been neglected by so many years in india i mean india jumped from agriculture to services literally straight away in terms of you know its economic growth in and i think this this is this is a very important signal that the government is trying to give that they are serious about manufacturing and i think uh, you know the stock market is an indication that they are taking these policies seriously but 6 months down the line after implementation how you know the recovery path is going to go when a vaccine is found we don't know how the stock market is going to be at that time okay sir thank you so we also have another question from dr sandeep chatterjee who also asks that countries like india have huge small and micro sector contributing immensely large population what opportunities do you see for this sector involving poor mass thank you sir uh, involving poor mass okay uh, i mean as i as i had mentioned in in my presentation you have uh, you know the handicraft sector the village based uh, the lot of village based activities industrial activities which you know can be uh, taken through on an export platform and this is where digital technologies is important because if you invest in a digital technology platform even for the small and micro sectors you could potentially open up the windows for them to sell directly you know uh, to smaller markets and there there is a lot of demand for indian hair uh, handicrafts and you know other kind of traditional uh, indian products uh, which uh, are uh, being by these enterprises so um, uh, it is important uh, from a policy perspective uh, to focus on as i said the potential of these sectors using digital technology to unlock their potential particularly to expose them to uh, the export markets and i think there's a there's a big opportunity there and informal sector uh, can work with the uh, with uh, some of the industries in the formal sector thank you sir thank you sir this is the last question we have right now so i would like to request ma'am to hand over the session thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you dr rahul said uh, for your huge contribution in this webinar and thanks to rimpa also uh, namaskar sir uh, now we enter uh, this is the high time to enter into the technical session 2 the speaker is dr riddhi chakraborty leader of higher national diploma programs in global banking school london UK she is also the pro, uh, professor of philosophy and global health in the american university of sovereign nations dr chakraborty is basically a bioethicist she did masters in philosophy from benares hindu university and also from american university of sovereign nations usa afterwards she pursued phd uh, in the indian institute of technology kharagpur where she also worked as the teacher assistant 
She has received Best Lecturer Award in Health and Social Care from London Churchill College, UK, and awarded fellowship from Higher Education Academy UK and also from the Royal Society of Medicine UK. Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty has been appointed as the member of World Emergency COVID-19 Pandemic Ethics Committee in UBS Ethics Institute, New Zealand and Thailand. She is working on the impact of COVID-19 on gender across the world. Dr. Chakraborty has published several books and a number of research papers in renowned journals. Her areas of interest are health, health sectors, health services, and ecology. She has occupied various positions in several committees in UK and in India. Today, she will speak on rethinking public health ethics during COVID-19. Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty, please. Over to Riddhi Chakraborty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to the world. And uh, thanks for this opportunity, actually. I will start sharing my screen. And please let me know if you can see my screen and if I am audible enough to. Yes, you are audible. Yes, you are audible. To, to share my screen. Screen presence. Good. Please carry on. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'll put it on the slideshow. And I'll, okay, so as it's starting, the um, I'm waiting for my slideshow to start. And meanwhile, thanks to the earlier speakers uh, for drawing the attention to the job loss, informal sector, recovery strategy, where health is uh, health is the uh, one sorry, of the priorities, probably the first step of as per the OECD. Yeah, the also thanks to you. Hello. Sorry to interrupt you. Your yeah. PPT is not visible. Yeah, can I continue? Your PPT is not visible. Not slide is not Sorry. visible. Yeah, I'm trying. I guess that's because Thank of low bandwidth. Uh, would you please again share your screen? Bye. Shall I share my entire screen, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, Just a minute. It happens because uh, of low bandwidth. So I guess you have a low bandwidth. Okay. So it is not still visible, it's buffering. Yes. Yeah, now it's visible. I can still yeah. see the screen in yeah? Yes. Yeah, we can see we can see it. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Sorry for this. Um, well, um, as I was started saying that thanks to the earlier speakers for drawing the attention to the job loss, informal sector, recovery strategy, and health as one of the recovery strategies as per the OECD uh, strategies. Uh, thanks to the speakers for also drawing the attention to the migrant issues, their lives and livelihoods, contract tracing app, be it New Zealand, be it India, and also in UK, also we have the contract tracing app as well. And we are asked to actually download the COVID app in our mobiles and so that when we go back to the work, we can actually use this and wherever you are going, you can use that. 
uh, thinking about all these issues and the uh, matter. So I thought to actually rethink about the public health ethics during COVID-19. And that's why I chose this topic to present in today's international webinar. Now, sorry, uh, just to, for a second, can, is my slide visible and am I audible enough? Yeah, your slide is visible and you are perfectly audible. Hello? Please go ahead. Your, your slide is visible and you are perfectly audible, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Right, uh, while coming back to the recovery strategy, is when health has been mentioned, uh, I would like to point out here that I categorize myself to those group of thinkers who think that the health should be the center or should be the focus of all the policies, be it economic policies, be it environmental policy, be it other policies. And COVID-19 is an eye-opener for this kind of thought. Now, uh, placing myself into that group, I would like to proceed with the presentation. Now, what is public health? Now, public health is basically some of the actions, some of the implementations that are taken to prevent disease, to promote health, and to prolong the life among the population as a whole. So basically, it's some of the interventions that are taken by the government, by the local authorities to actually to increase the longevity of the people, to prevent diseases and to prevent the infection as well, considering the protection and improving the health of the people and their communities. Few of the interventions that involve in the public health are about promoting healthy lifestyles, say for the diabetic prevention strategy, researching disease and injury prevention and detecting and preventing and responding to infectious diseases. The four main focus of public health are the health protection, definitely, health improvement, healthcare and the public health as well, and academic public health, because without research, there is no value in the implementation and in the actions. Now, where is ethics or why health has to be a concern or health of people has to be a concern? Now, health is individual. Definitely, individually, we all we all should be concerned about our health. So when we go to the hospitals, so the doctors checks our individual health. But when we think about the community as a whole, the public health experts, they think about the public health. That is where health is a common good. Now, thinking from this perspective, the public health concerns are, say, to prevent the non-communicable diseases, to prevent the infectious and the communicable diseases as well. When it comes to the non-communicable disease, uh, the interventions, the public health interventions are mainly in the lifestyle changes, the behavioral changes, which can prolong the longevity. The example, as I have given, it's uh, the, say the diabetes prevention. So in the United Kingdom, specifically, they are trying to implement, they have implemented in many boroughs about how the people can change their lifestyle, their food habit, their life pattern, everything, so that they can prevent the diabetes in the long run. Now, when it comes to the infectious or the communicable diseases, the, the public health concern is that one individual is enough to spread infection. And COVID-19 is a live example for this. So the community level, national level intervention in the short span of time is required, which includes the social distancing measures, the isolation, quarantine, lockdown, the janta curfew, if we can say, vaccination as well. So when these are the concerns and these are the matters of public interest, so public health becomes a concern and health becomes a major focus of the public health. These interventions also imply a sense of obligation, duty, and responsibility. Somebody has to take the actions. Somebody has to decide on how the interventions are to be implemented. Or if any decisions go wrong, then somebody has to decide or somebody has to work on that, how that can be corrected. This brings in the ethics within the domain of the public health. Now, public health ethics is basically a systematic process to clarify, to prioritize, to justify the possible courses of action based on ethical principles, values, beliefs of stakeholders, scientific and other information. It is subdivided into the field of action, field of study, and where it actually, and also a field of practice. When it's a field of study and field of practice, it considers different principles and value frameworks for decision making and means of justifying the implementations, the actions of the public health.
Now, what can be the framework? Now, in ethics, in the traditional ethics, in bioethics, the, there are different frameworks which we can take for the public health actions. So one is utilitarian ethics that's rooted in the consequentialism. And if I have to intervene a public health action based on the utilitarian ethics or with the foundation on the utilitarian ethics, I might say that maybe I will go for the cost benefit analysis of all the actions. The, this perspective may be a little bit inclined towards the economic analysis as well because they are thinking of the greatest good of the greatest number of people. Now, the other framework, which is very important in the public health ethics, is the principle or the value-based framework, which depends on the communities, which depends from the community to communities, from countries to countries as well. So which principles, which values you actually focus more or you prioritize more. So whatever public health interventions then come in, they particularly follow several principles, they follow several values as well. If I can give an example, say the New Zealand pandemic plan, they are very much actually oriented to the Maori values as well. The Maoris are the indigenous tribes there, and they are the original people there, if I can say. And the whatever values they have, the New Zealand pandemic plan, pandemic influenza plan, actually, um, they have actually included those Maori values in their plans. But when the COVID struck, uh, the New Zealand government noticed that those the whole pandemic influenza plan, although guided by those values, they are falling short somewhere because the COVID is a new kind of disease. The virus is a new new kind of novel disease, which is a bit different from the influenza virus. So they have to think about the different kind of plan. They are incorporating many of those values, but also new values as well. Now, even though we have the these frameworks in the public health domain to work on the public health ethics, the cases are different. And in different contexts, in different situations, in different countries, public health actions are then determined on the case-to-case -case basis as well. But definitely, they are guided by some visions, missions, uh, underlying some of the values as well. Now, then why I'm discussing about the public health problem and why I'm discussing about the public health ethics, because pandemics is a public health problem. All pandemics are public health problems and public health concern and ethics are intertwined with those actions which we take to prevent this pandemic. To define this pandemic, as a, it's a simultaneous outbreak in a large population over a broad geographical area out of the same disease agent. It comes in unusual, extensive, severe, rapid epidemics manner. It comes in waves. So as we are seeing, say the my earlier speaker, uh, Dr. Sain mentioned that, um, uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, my earlier speaker actually mentioned about that in New Zealand, they got the second wave from the August probably. In the UK, it hadn't died down probably, it's, but it's coming back again. So that it, we can say that it's a second wave again. So it comes in waves, but it is very extensive, very severe, and very rapid, which gives us very less time or less span of time to decide and to take actions properly. So the, as I mentioned, so the pandemics are the global epidemics and they are the public health problems. They have the potential to cause serious harm to the health of individuals as well as to the population, which can be prevented or can be reduced by appropriate decisions and actions of different agencies at the right time. And as I mentioned before, the public health actions involve the concept of freedom, duties, obligations, and responsibilities. And therefore, it brings in ethics to its domain to plan and implement right decisions and justified actions. Now, the three major ethical issues of pandemics of infectious diseases are the distribution of resources, be it human, be it medical. And if you have noticed in this COVID time, so probably every day the newspaper were reporting how many actually we have the shortage of doctors in hospitals, how many doctors have died because of the shortage of the personal protective equipment, we couldn't supply them. It doesn't matter which country we belong to, but wherever we are actually geographical, geographically placed, but we face the same crisis everywhere. The reason being because very few countries in the world, they actually produce these PPEs. And with the COVID-19 lockdown, so the global transport actually halted and that's the crisis started. And also there is a problem of the procurement depends on the finance or the economic condition of the countries as well. So in short, we face the distribution of resources. 
Now then is the prioritization. So what about the prioritization? Who will you prioritize? Who will you give the preference in the hospitals? Which kind of patient you will first admit? The ICU admissions, what about that? What about the vaccines and the treatments? Uh, so when they are manufactured, where, when the treatment regime comes into the practice, so who will get the first treatment? Now, many countries are trying to uh, manufacture the COVID vaccines, but who will get the vaccines? The manufacturing countries or will the manufacturing countries be able to help the other countries where it's probably the crisis are rising and the country is not in a state or not in a condition to manufacture the vaccine? Uh, yesterday, I was listening to the BBC News and they said that uh, the Oxford group here who are trying to manufacture the vaccine and it's in the trial phase, the COVID-19 vaccine, I mean. So they are trying to say that we will make sure that it will have a fair distribution across the globe. But that remains to be seen in the future when the vaccine is in the market. Uh, for the hospital admissions, yes, I can give the example from here as well, from the United Kingdom. It's like they have restricted all the hospital admissions except the COVID patients during this uh, in March-April time, March-April-May time. And the crisis was so much that the, all the ICUs got overwhelmed, many hospitals got closed. Um, I know even in India, um, the place I come from, the Kolkata, the hospitals in different private hospitals, the ICU wards are mainly for the COVID patients. And if you, if your any of your family members need the ICU admissions for other medical reasons, for our other medical conditions, either you have to pay more or you have to talk to, you have to make a good rapport with the hospital admis administrations as well. Uh, that's from my experience, but it's uh, not to make it a generic example, by the way. The other issue or other major ethical issue of the pandemic is the duty and obligations often towards healthcare workers to treat. Now, doctors being the doctors, the nurses, all healthcare workers, they work in the front line during the COVID and during the other pandemics as well. So it's an obligation and a responsibility and duty of the government or of the hospital administrations that when you are putting your employees in those situations, so you supply them with the protective gears, which should be adequate, which should be sufficient, so, so that they do not succumb to all these conditions. So that's why it's an ethical issue. Now, also, it's about the public health measures and balancing the rights and interests. Now, we see from the cases in different countries that in many places, the lockdown has been announced in very short span of time, given four hours probably in many countries. So that's a public health measure. Right. So you have you are asked to say that you have to stay at home. You have to isolate yourself. You have to be in quarantine. But what about the rights and interests of the people? I was listening to the news actually a few days back and um, there were some videos actually circulating in the social media where it said that in many countries, the people who are returning from other states or other provinces, they are saying that you have to, uh, you have to isolate yourself, you choose whether you want to go home or whether you want to stay in the government designated hotels. But being a student, say, for example, traveling from one place to another, that uh, hotel expense was too high to be up. And there comes your rights and interests. So you are implementing a public health measure. The government is implementing a public health measure. But what about the interest? And what about I might not want to go to the hotel. I might prefer to go to my home and isolate myself. But then what about the contact tracing as well? What about reporting to the government? So these issues make the public health and the pandemics a public health concern and ethics come into the domain of it. Now, uh, for after COVID-19 is basically a new disease. It's everywhere it's reported, it's a new disease, but it's not that new. It's a novel virus, definitely, but we have the similar kinds of virus before. So we had the SARS in 2003. Yes, many countries were not affected, but those who were affected, they were severely affected. But that time, SARS was not declared as a pandemic. SARS was declared as an epidemic because it didn't touch different other countries of the globe or different hemispheres of the globe so it was restricted to say some of the asian countries but it was potential enough to cause a public health concern or to raise the alarm for the public health concern in those countries and the whole globe to be honest to be frank they have taken the lessons from the sars outbreak in from those countries and how the countries have dealt with it
Then we have the AH1N1, the swine flu, or the in, that's a kind of influenza pandemic in 2009. In India, there were different cases, but as the whole of India was not affected by it, probably we are not very aware of it. But now, as we read more, we know more about it. But many countries were affected by it, and different countries that time, that is the first time probably uh, that World Health Organization asked all its member states, member countries to prepare the pandemic influenza plan, that all the countries should have this pandemic influenza plan. Developed countries came up with their plans. They already had it because they suffer from the seasonal influenza and they know the importance that how its pandemic influenza can actually strike and what it can go wrong. So they had their plans. But different developing countries uh, in South Asia as well, they weren't prepared about it. So that was a struggle that time. So they came up with the draft plans and to took the actions to actually uh, deal with the situations. Uh, India is one of that country, to be honest. Now, post SARS literature, so from the SARS onwards and from, in, from 2003, 2004, and then into the 2009, and then in 2000, this 1920 time, the people, the public health experts, they become very concerned about the values, very concerned about the um, use of the values, use of the expressions while preparing their plans and implementing their plans as well. Now, if I can show you how many, sorry. If I can show you how many values and the expressions the public health experts actually uh, thought about, so you will see the from starting from the accountability, communication, how the communication is to be proper, autonomy, collaboration, confidentiality, consent, diversity, duty, ethics is definitely part of it, equality, fairness, freedom, justice, and it's a whole list of values that actually the thinkers, the public health experts, the researchers, ethicists, bioethicists, they have thought about it. And the main concern is that it should be part of their, uh, within the pandemic plan, within the, say, the any, any pandemic plan and any disaster management plan as well. Now, these are, so from the post-SARS period, so these are some of the values that are incorporated in the different countries' pandemic plans. Now, what about the COVID pandemic? So is it any different or do we need such kind of values to guide us during the COVID-19 actions or do we have to rethink about those values? So let's see uh, and let's proceed with this uh, COVID-19 concept and we will see as we discuss more about the case and issues of out of the COVID-19. So as we all know by now that the COVID-19 actually started from the December 2019, late November 19, um, December 2019, a particular kind of pneumonia was circulating in China. So the doctor who raised the alarm, unfortunately, the doctor actually passed away who succumbed to this particular pneumonia while treating the patients. But China actually declared it as an emergency in January. And by January, late January, February, the travel ban started and it spread to the other parts of the globe as well. And it was declared as pandemic. And by that time, we got to know that the, this particular kind of virus is the SARS-CoV-2. SARS so SARS-1 in 2003, and this is SARS-CoV-2, uh, and it's causing the COVID, globally the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, by June 2020, COVID-19 has affected over 6.9 million people, claiming more than 400,000 lives in over 200 nations all over the world. Now, some issues of the COVID-19 pandemic are definitely it's a novel disease. It, uh, the virus was kind of the SARS-CoV-1 virus, but definitely it has got new structures in it. It's a uh, mutation level is of different genre. It's, uh, it's of the same family, but it's of a different kind. So that's why the disease outbreak has been called as the novel disease. What did it do in the global market? It destroyed $23 trillion in global market since mid-February. But that was the data from the March 2020. At by now, as the lockdown being extended, or in many places, the lockdown started for the second time as well. So this value is much more. Now, what about the public health measures of the lockdown measures that, have, that were taken for the COVID-19 pandemic? Now, in China, the country had to lead to the biggest quarantine in the history. They were affected in SARS 2003 as well, but they they were not in a position to take that kind of bigger step. They did implement a few measures, few restrictions, but it was not of that kind of magnitude. 
Now, in due to the, the COVID-19 in China, they enacted the draconian quarantine fully eight hours after announcing it, allowing perhaps one million potentially infectious people to leave the Wuhan city at the first stage. I have a Chinese colleague and she described to me because her mother is back in China and her mother got stuck in one place. She couldn't go back to her native place because the quarantine started that time, the lockdown measure started. In India, the law enforcement came in place with the implementation of the Epidemic Disease Act of 1897 and probably few hours were given when the first lockdown started. The other issues out of the COVID-19 is the health inequity. As we know that whatever disasters come in, the people who are disadvantaged, the people who are vulnerable, the people who are socioeconomically poor, not in a good state, they actually suffer more during any kind of disasters. And pandemics are no less exception than those situations. Now, in the United Kingdom, gradually the data came up. It's not at the very initial stage of the pandemic, but later on from the May onwards, and the data actually came up that the minority groups the black, Asian, and the other minority ethnic groups are disproportionately affected. The people who are originally from Philippines, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, they are hardly hit out of the COVID-19. They Most of them have lost their lives. Uh, from these particular groups, many people are affected, mainly the main contracted the, the more disease and the main people, the male people, male of those populations actually were hard hit in cause of disease or in case of deaths as well. In the USA, the United States of America, the African Americans are the worst hit. So what we can see from these issues is that definitely COVID-19 has some economic impacts, big, huge economic impact, huge financial losses across the sectors, across the globe. We also see that when the public health measures of lockdown and other public health measures were implemented, so it actually either it had to be implemented lawfully very with an enforceful manner or and with the strong law enforcement, which compelled many people to actually compromise in their rights and interest. We also see that many of the lives and many, many of the health of the particular groups actually were compromised because health inequities continue to rise during the COVID-19 pandemic. We also see, as I mentioned before, that there was shortage of personal protective equipment it, uh, it across the globe, actually. So it's, it didn't matter whether you are in the developed country or developing country, but it did hit all people, all communities across the globe. How many healthcare workers we have seen to be died during the COVID-19? A lot. It started with the China and it happened everywhere. There was a phase in the March, April, February end, March, April time. So we Italian doctors were in the news. So this day, this doctor has been passed away. That day, that nurse has been passed away. It happened in the United Kingdom as well. And it happened in India as well. So it affected the healthcare workers across the globe. And as they are working in the front line, as they are working, treating these patients of the COVID-19. So some, some probably in many places, they were not given enough protective measures, enough protective gears to do their duty. And that's how with the obligation towards the healthcare workers become a concern during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now for the prioritization and the triage policy. So in different countries, we actually, as part of the WECOP committee, we worked on the prioritization and the triage policies across the globe. And we have noticed that different countries have adopted different framework, different principles behind this, how to prioritize the uh, patients in the ICU, how to prioritize the COVID patients in the ITU and how to do the triaging. So in the United States, they actually followed that saving the most lives and saving the most life years that have actually, they continued working on with this policy and this framework. In France, they adopted the policy that the best chance of survival. So they will admit those people who will have the best chance of survival in the ICU. Now, the another issue that came up in the COVID-19 is about the data privacy. Uh, and data confidentiality as well. So what about the contact tracing app? Uh, so we are everyone probably in India, I got the news that they were asked to download the Arogo Shetu app. But what about your individualness and it about your privacy? Is it tracing your locations? What about that? 
the COVID-19 app I have downloaded in my mobile, we are asked to download so that whenever we are entering the buildings in your workplaces, we can see that building is COVID safe or not. But what about my locations here again? So what about my privacy? Why would I want to disclose my locations to governments? Why, why I have to do that? So there comes out my interest versus the data privacy versus the government interest as well. Now, one example from the public health measures, which actually recommended by the Nuffield Health Council, that how ethics can guide the public health measures in the countries, how it needs to be implemented so that it can balance all the dilemmas or balance all the rights, interests, and can also be proportional and fair at the same time. So what Nuffield Council, based in the United Kingdom, they say that interventions should be evidence-based, proportionate with engagement from the public. You need to discuss with your stakeholders, discuss with your communities and public that what measures can be implemented here, in what way and in what manner, without disturbing the lifestyle of the people. They also mentioned that importance to be given with clear communication to the public, that from when onwards I'm starting, how long I want to implement, and there should be clear communication, but with a proper discussion, discussion with your stakeholders. Coercion, intrusion into people's lives should be minimum, consistent with achieving the aim sought. It's not that, do I have to really enforce the law? Do I have to really enforce any Epidemic Disease Act? It's a time to think about it and how it's actually affecting the or coercing the livelihoods of the people. So it's high time that we think about it when introducing the public health measures, implementing the public health measures. The NAFIL Council actually also mentioned of that people should be treated as moral equals and they should be considered as worthy of respect. It, the government shouldn't think in the way that I'm implementing the law, I'm enforcing the law, I'm bringing back my some disease act or something. But I would, would consider the people as well as the moral equals. They have their interest as well. So there should be a balance between them. The Nuffield Council also mentions about showing the due respect to individuals, which should never be forgotten in the way in which interventions such as quarantine and self-isolations are implemented. Solidarity is crucial at this moment at the international level between the governments and at the local levels as well. In business sector, so it should be like in support from the state for those bearing the costs of interventions by business in how they exercise their corporate social responsibility and at individual level in the way we all respond to the outbreak in day to day life. What it means is that at the individual level, so if we got to know uh, when we are in the phase of reopening our institutions, going back to our workplaces, so we should not stigmatize or we should not have any kind of discrimination of to the people, to the students, to the our colleagues that who have had support from the COVID-19 as well. So there should be a sense of solidarity. And also say if there are livelihood losses, if there are students maybe who lagged behind in the studies, we should show, our, show our solidarity towards them as well. Uh, the Nafil Council also keeps on mentioning that the three core ethical values to make up the ethical compass of the plan of the public health measures implementation. As I mentioned, number one is the solidarity. Number two, we should consider help reduce, reducing the suffering, be it financial, be it physical, be it mental, be it the overall health indicators as well. So we should actually compress with the value of the non maleficence there. The respect and equal respect actually should be the another value which should be implemented in our plans and in our actions and fairness, which should be the top of the priority list in implementing all these actions. Now, when I come to India, so what is the situation there? In India, so it's, is it the first time that the magnitude of the COVID-19 actually halted all our lives and all? Not in a way, uh, not in a way, because we India had faced the infectious disease outbreaks, epidemics in the past. But yes, in the scale, the magnitude of it is much bigger because the whole country is in lockdown now. But earlier it happened that the curfew actually implemented in the localized places. But uh, now it's at the national level because it's affecting everyone. And with the more international travels, it's uh, coming and entering through the you know all the borders of India. Now, in 1994, the plague struck in Gujarat and we had the, uh, 197 confirmed cases with 54 deaths. Uh, the mainly cities where the underprivileged communities live, they were mostly affected. So we didn't have to worry much because we are not affected that time. 
in during the 2009 uh, and 9 10 the ah1n1 or the swine flu pandemic rates were higher among the younger population maharashtra mumbai and uh, gujarat rajasthan delhi they were most affected but we didn't have to worry much because the whole of india wasn't affected that time but we were only concerned not to travel to those places during that time uh, after pandemic, the AH1N1, uh, it was noticed that the, it was higher among the adults. While during the pandemic, it was higher among the younger population. But after the pandemic, it was during the mostly among the adults. And the higher morbidity was seen in urban Rajasthan, but the higher mortality was seen in rural Rajasthan. So all these studies gradually tried to come up after the pandemic of 2009, that is AH1N1 because many of the states it's just not one state but many of the states were affected that time but not the whole country the, what ah1n1 also actually brought our attention to is the existing social and economic disparities the disproportionate pandemic outcomes the people who are in the lowest social economic strata people who are disadvantaged they are most affected and when it went to the rural areas rural geographical locations so they didn't get any proper health care they had to come to the cities and meanwhile it also come by the way the ah1n1 also comes with the pneumonia as well uh, it it causes other uh, respiratory infection as well and people actually succumb to it in few hours if they do not get it get any proper hospital admissions or proper treatments now uh, what about the public health measures during the COVID-19 time yes what we got to know from the earlier slide is that that there are issues there were issues in India from the different infectious disease outbreak but probably we didn't think about it in that way uh, the pandemic plan of India was in a draft stage which, uh, which wasn't finalized until probably 12 13 but it's uh, it keeps on drafting redrafting and the revised version comes in a draft plan as well but uh, but at least it has got a plan but many countries they haven't got a plan yet although the world health organization recommendations is that they have to have the pandemic plan all countries have the should have the pandemic plan now when it comes to the covid 19 and the public health measures in india so what about it so let's see i take one example from here but i'm quite sure there are other examples as well uh, it's good that uh, that we can discuss about this issue because earlier speakers mentioned about the economic impact on the informal sector and the job loss. So let's see what the case is all about. So during this COVID-19 pandemic, the economic downturn has greatly affected people from the lower socioeconomic stratum. The internal migrant workers, intra and interstate, constitutes the informal sector total to a staggering 139 million, about 93% of the Indian workforce. Now, about 50% of migration, migrant workers had rations for less than a day when interviewed for the study in, uh, in 2020, actually, in May 2020. And this is when they had the rations for less than a day when the lockdown started. Stranded Workers Action Network showed that 89% had not been paid wages by their employers during the first 21 days of lockdown and that 74% had less than half their daily wages to live on when the lockdown started. And it continued during the lockdown phase as well. The economic impact of the pandemic seemed to be more severe in the following manner. It increased the poverty, pushing more people below poverty line in the country. It worsened socioeconomic inequalities, thus affecting the health and the nutrition indices as well. It compromised health-related precautions, say use of masks, social distancing, seeking medical advice in case of cough and fever and etc. So if you are asking people to use them more, you are actually pushing them or giving them a threshold of the economic and the financial expense as well. So what about that? These are not free. You have to buy it, right? But you do not have job on the other hand. The World Economic Forum states that in the current pandemic situation, migrants stuck abroad trying to cope with the exigencies which compromise by taking up low wage jobs, living in poor working conditions and restrict spending, thereby risking the exposures of the COVID-19 as well. Now, if this is a case study, so we know that our lockdown measures in the country, the whatever the public health measures we have uh, we have adopted for the COVID-19 or what we were instructed to adopt for COVID-19. So this is a case from that. So if we want to analyze it ethically, so what values we can implement here? Uh, 
the first thing that come to my mind, or maybe because I work in the justice framework, is the justice issues. What about the fair implementation? But also the other thing that come up in the mind is about what about balancing these rights and interests of these migrant workers? Did we talk to them about it before taking the implementation measures? Did we consult them? Did we, didn't we get chance? I would say, yes, we did. We did get a chance, but how you implement it, uh, that's up to the different agencies, actually. And that's a matter of discussion. That's a matter of concern. So these are, so I leave the values to think about. Uh, I mean, it's better that you discuss, you think about the case study and discuss about the values because the values differ from individual to individual. Values differ from the communities to communities. Values differ from country to country. But that is why we need to sit and think about together. We need to sit together and think about the values and then implement the actions. And that's where, where the planning comes in. That's where the pandemic planning comes in, and that's where the disaster management planning and preparation comes in. So that's all from my side, and um, these are some of the sources that have been referred, and I welcome any questions, and thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty. Uh, for, uh, your speech is highly informative and analytical also. Uh, delivered on public health ethics during COVID-19. Thank you very much, Dr. Chakraborty. Now we would like to request Professor Devabrata Mukhopadhyay to take a short overview of the lecture delivered by Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty, followed by question answer of technical session two in philosophy. Professor Mukhopadhyay, please. Can't hear you. Ha, hello. Yeah, ha. hello. So uh, thank you, Dr. Ritika, for uh, your uh, a very interesting and informative lecture. Uh, but what I understood from your, uh, your lecture, uh, I will just point out on uh, some of the things. Uh, but particularly, I uh, started uh, on the on the beginning of hypothesis that health should be to lecture, I, I understood what I am saying. Health should be the center of focus of all policies, including economic policies. He also pointed out about uh, four major domains of uh, health. And he considered, uh, he considered that uh, health in uh, and individual as well as uh, a good uh, Hence, he distinguished between diseases, uh, lifestyle diseases, as well as uh, communicable diseases, uh, in order to address communicable diseases like COVID-19, he pointed out that social distancing, lockdown, quarantine measures, public uh, uh, factors are very important. Intervention for action is very important. But at the uh, same time, uh, these actions or interventions raise certain Subtle uh, ethical issues to be taken care of by the public. Uh, interestingly, as he pointed out on two uh, major uh, ethical perspectives, uh, one is consequentialism, another is uh, what I understood value based or deontology. Uh, uh, as far as the consequent, uh, consequentialist or utilitarianism uh, perspective is concerned, uh, her point is that most of economic analysis is based on uh, on COVID-19, based on the sequential factors. But uh, in case of uh, the ethical issues, it should be taken properly care of. Emphasis should be based on uh, value-based factors. He pointed out that health policies should uh, consider uh, social value and any health policy cannot be uh, independent of the social in environment in which the policy is being uh, taken care of. Three major uh, ethical issues we pointed out uh, about uh, distribution of resources as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, like 
utilization uh, uh, of resources, uh, human and medical, then prioritization of supply, etc. Third one is uh, duties and obligations of healthcare workers. And then uh, also uh, it points out about uh, other uh, issues like like all typical issues like uh, admission priority, data privacy, these are all things which are, uh, which are uh, entering into the domain of uh, public uh, uh, the private uh, autonomy. So uh, another uh, point uh, is that uh, uh, that uh, proper policies or uh, actions they can go that to maintain solidarity health, uh, uh, reading, suffering, uh, yes. Again, uh, uh, we also raised about the concerns, the disease of the modern culture of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and there are many possibilities that COVID-19 is poverty, any not audible. Not listening properly. Ah, these uh, points or these uh, observations would be uh, very much helpful uh, to the uh, audience, uh, participants, in particular the students from social science background. Thank you, Professor uh, Devabrata Mukhopadhyay, uh, for your comment on Riddhi Chakraborty's Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty's uh, speech. Now we request uh, Onkita Ghosh, faculty, Dirozio Memorial College, uh, uh, to uh, place questions before Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty. Onkita, please. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very much thankful to Dr. Riddhi Chakraborty, Madam, for this thought-provoking presentation. Uh, madam, we have received some questions uh, from our participants. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I'm, I would like to deliver you. The first question from Professor Obina Srivastav. Uh, you, are, uh, you are speaking an ethical dilemma which come before every physician. While, uh, while giving opportunity to the patients. But how to come out of it, modus operandi, has also been explained. Please, madam. Right. That depends on the... Thanks for the thought, actually. It's a good question, I would say. And that is where ethics come in. So we need to have the hospital administration committee to think and decide about it. So what are the challenges? What are the... Because every hospital will have new challenges or different challenges. It can't be that, uh, say, one size fits all. No, there is no one solution to fit in every hospital situations, right? So because of the differential capacities. So that, that is where we need to have the group of thinkers thinking involving the ethicist and also the doctors, the bioethicists, that so they should come and think about how these situations can be resolved. Is it financial problem that is causing the main issue actually or is, is there any other reason that is causing the problem? So we need to think about it in that way. But we need a committee. It's the, without the disaster management plan at the micro and the macro level and at the meso level as well, we cannot decide anything and this will be a recurring problem again and again. So that implies that we need a proper planning. We need a proper agencies to sit and decide. Thank you. Oh, thank you, madam. Uh, madam, we have another question uh, from uh, Shoma Roy. Uh, uh, forceful lockdown saved life of people, but morally they are in depressed, especially students who are out of touch long time. What are the remedies? Well, uh, what Please are the remedy? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for this is another good question. I would say, uh, what are the remedies? This is again remedies for what? I need to think about my students. I would, 
yeah i will give uh, our example what i did okay. well we deal with we deal with thousands of students right so when we are dealing with the students when the lockdown started and we got to know that we have to move from the face to face to the online teaching uh, that was a new system and that, that was a very you know innovative system we had to actually think about so what we did that time we called we divided among ourselves we allocated the groups among ourselves and we decided that who to call how to call and discuss about the what is the internet facility at their home how they can access the online learning sessions as well but i would add we do have a virtual learning environment where we do upload our materials for them to see when in their you know offline uh, when they are in the offline when they want to study from the home but that's different but for the online lecturing we did that and how to bring back the camp, you know students back in the campus it's like i spoke about it yesterday but again we are still thinking about it uh, where i work our students are coming from this monday and we are completely totally assuring them it's a covid safe place please come back to the campus and all but given the national situation i honestly do not know what to happen but that's a public safety but we are trying to take all the public health measures and the um, concerns are taken care of for the public health safety there in our places but what about the students educational aspects and the other mental health and all that depends in in the individual cases as i mentioned so we have the designated student welfare team who will take care of the students mental health who probably have been lagging behind in education and the study but it, that depends on the case to case that depends on the institution to institution basis isn't it but also as i mentioned yesterday and i'm again i love to repeat it today as well um, is that when as a teacher when you are a teacher you are a teacher when you are committed to your profession you are committed to your profession so like the doctors and the physicians so when i'm taking care of my student and it's like taking care of my family member so but the side point is that we have to take care of the student their educational side and when they have lagged behind is there any particular issues that they have faced what about their mental conditions so as a teacher we will try to uh, do the counseling as best as we can and then designated a um, it to the some college authorities if there is any so that might help to reduce the problem but for the long term solutions we need to sit and think that what can we do depends on the individual case basis that's all i can say because it's a very new situation with the educational sector sorry i can't hear you ankita you are muted sorry madam sorry it's okay yeah. um, um, we have another question from dr ashish kumar karan the question is the morality of individualism has completely lost its balance in regard with the value of living in community express your observation please sorry madam. can you repeat the question please yes yes madam obviously of course um uh, uh, the morality of individualism has completely lost its balance in regard with the values of living in community express your observation please well there comes the concept of the shared responsibility right and cooperation and solidarity that's why i mentioned about the value of the solidarity i need to think about my individualism definitely but i can't compromise my health and safety and security and push myself in the risky situation so same is the other person in the community as well but as a member of the community i do have my obligation i do have my responsibility to take care of my community because these kinds of infectious disease outbreaks it's like it's a one single person is enough to make a place covid unsafe one single person is enough to spread the disease in the community so if you see the mm, progression of the uh, covid 19 if you can see one person was in march february march time actually one person was capable enough to infect five or 10 people so it's the same situation now so we have to worry about it and i would say not compromise but it's think about the shared responsibility and make yourself safe take care of yourself but also make your community safe as well uh thank you madam uh, actually we have received lot of questions from our participant but due to the uh, time limitation we are not able to deliver all of this to you uh thank you madam once again uh, for this uh, nice presentation uh thanks to our participants for their active cooperation with us i would like to request dr shukla chatterjee madam to continue please
over to shukla madam uh, thank you thank you uh, ankita uh, uh, dr chakraborty there is another question from rahul sen our former speaker so i am yeah, to, yeah, I I, yeah i put it uh, yeah. before you that uh, your speech is very interesting and presentation also it's a tricky situation when yeah. someone dies from covid and their family members are flying in uh, uh say uh, in new zealand should they be allowed to attend funeral amid this the managed uh, isolation we had cases of people breaking managed isolation rules breaking isolation rules to attend funeral of a loved ones yeah i was trying to write to him but uh, that's good that we are discussing it now um, right uh, well first thing is about um, breaking the rules it's everywhere right but that there comes a concept of the nudging how you educate your community how you make them ethically aware how you make them legally aware of the situations and law enforcement also comes in but the first point is about how you educate your community to behave properly considering all these public health concerns and considerations um taking into place right uh, about the funerals it's there was one situation dr shane when i lost one of my colleagues actually uh, during the covid and uh, we weren't allowed to attend the funeral we, uh, his family members weren't allowed to attend the funeral that time the, i lost him in april and the funeral was in may but only it and all everything was arranged virtually okay so few people designated people who deal with the funeral the funeral directors here they are dealing with it but all other people were asked to attend it virtually now with the uh, relaxation of the restrictions here a bit there are few people who are allowed it uh, but it depends on the nations actually say if it's differing in scotland and in england so in england it's 30 people who can actually attend the funerals but in scotland it's 20 people who can attend the uh, funerals so group gatherings should be restricted definitely but uh, if the family members at least depends on the situation or the rate of infections in the geographical spaces the it the numbers should be restricted thank you thank you dr uh, chakraborty for your highly enthusiastic deliverance and uh, now we have entered into the finishing phase of the webinar now we request uh, dr anjuna chattopadhyay joint secretary of the seminar program committee of our college to deliver vote of thanks dr anjuna Ch chatterjee please thank you shubhavi am i audible yes am i little bit louder thank you good afternoon everyone now we are in the concluding part of the webinar and on behalf of the department of economic and philosophy and seminar program committee i take the opportunity to propose the vote of thanks We are grateful to our respective president, governing body, and deputy mayor of Vidyanagar Municipal Corporation, Vidyapur Strategy, for the great support and guidance to this institution. I would like to thank Dr. Kuntendu Kalapathu, principal, Guruji Memorial College, for his enthusiasm, support, and encouragement, which goes a long way to boost up our confidence. I acknowledge the contributions of members of governing body in the smooth running of the webinar. I would like to thank Dr. Sushil Mukherjee for her inaugural speech and her support as the coordinator of IQAP and the financial support provided by Internal Quality Assurance Trust. We are grateful to Prof. Devendra Mukherjee, Department of Economics of West Bengal State University, for his inspiring keynote address, which I think has left us in this inferior way. I would like to thank our distinguished speakers, Dr. Rahul Sen. Senior Lecturer, Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand, and Dr. Rishi Chakraborty, FHTA Program Leader, London, UK, for their wonderful discourse, which definitely has broadened our spectrum of knowledge. We are indebted and thankful to the international participants from Canada and from all over India, mainly from Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh, Delhi, without whom this webinar would have been meaningless. Your participation has increased our team, and we look forward to your participation in our future endeavors. 
I would like to thank the organizing secretary, Dr. Shikha Chatterjee, of the Department of Economics, and Dr. Chandramukta Dasgupta of the Department of Philosophy for organizing this very informative international webinar. I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Ruby Rai, our librarian, as technical coordinator, and Simoti Shuma Rai of the Economics Department, and Simoti Hongkita Coach of the Department of Philosophy for their technical support. Without their help, it would not have been possible to organize this academic meet. I'd like to thank the Kishokrat Mandal of the Department of Bengali and John Consumer of Central Program Committee for his valuable advice from time to time. I'd like to mention the names of Dr. Kosma Ghosh of the Department of Philosophy and Rima Chandra of the Department of Economics, who have helped in all possible ways. We are grateful to all faculty members of the Department of our college for their unified approach in making the webinar a uh, success. We cannot forget the contributions of non teaching staff for their constant support in all our activities. We thank the members of Students' Union for their supportive role in all our activities. We are indeed happy to have the students of Economics and Philosophy Department for their active participation. We are grateful to Google Incorporation for allowing us to use their products and services like YouTube, Gmail, Speed of Course, and other software for the webinar. We are also thankful to Streamer for allowing us to use this platform for the webinar. To conclude, we convey our thanks in advance to those viewers who will take a look uh, to this webinar on YouTube in future. Before we depart, I wish all of you have enriched yourself from the webinar and we look forward to your kind participation and cooperation in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anjuna. Now we request Dr. Dibindu Talapachu, principal of our college, to close the webinar. Dr. Talapachu, please. Sir, please. I guess sir is not there. That case. So, uh, on behalf of uh, our college, we, clo we are closing the webinar here. And thank you very much to all of you. Thanks. Namaskar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the opportunity and for organizing this webinar. And no. Shangamitra Ji. Shukla Ji, thank you. Uh, yes. thank you. Thanks for your contribution. Yes. Everything. You are very junior to me, but you have contributed a lot. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> Dr. Chakraborty also. Yeah. Thank very you, Riti. Interesting Riti. presentation. Hmm. Thank, thank you, Riti. Thank Rahul. you. Uh, but